Paul's writing ministry during the years of his imprisonment is demonstrated by his New Testament letters to the churches in Colossa, Ephesus, and Philippi, and to the Colossian man Philemon. Through these letters, Paul was able to provide relevant pastoral ministry to churches and individuals. And since these writings were preserved for us in the New Testament, Paul's ministry has been multiplied throughout the world for the past 2,000 years. Paul's writings reveal a rich ministry to churches and individuals with whom he had ongoing relationships. He knew many things about their circumstances and about them personally. And as a result, Paul was able to address many specific issues that concern his audiences, both personal and theological. He even instructed some individuals by name. Despite his inability to travel, Paul's ministry was informed and carefully tailored to the specific situations of the churches and individuals to whom he wrote. Paul also directed his letters to the theological issues that involve the church as a whole, providing authoritative apostolic instruction with a pastoral hand. His teaching ministry as an authoritative representative of Christ did not falter during his imprisonment. Rather, Paul continued to provide infallible revelations of truth during this time and continued to apply that truth to the church through his letters. Needless to say, Paul's letters from prison share a number of important doctrinal foundations. Most basically, they all affirm the same gospel. But as we all know, the Christian gospel is a multifaceted message. So it's also important to realize that Paul's letters from prison are unified by several aspects of the gospel that were especially important for Paul personally during his years of imprisonment and important for those who first received his prison epistles. Our discussion of the theological unity of the prison epistles will focus on three closely connected teachings that Paul returned to time and again in these letters. First, we'll look at the doctrine that Jesus Christ is King of creation. Second, we'll focus on a particular aspect of Jesus' kingship, namely believers' union with Christ in his kingship. And third, we'll see that these two doctrines point toward the requirements of ethical living. Let's look first at Paul's teaching that Jesus Christ is the King of creation. Paul's emphasis on Christ as the King of creation is perhaps more pronounced in his letters from prison than in any of his other writings. We'll consider three aspects of Christ's kingship that appear frequently in these epistles. Christ's sovereignty, including his power and authority, his honor, including his glory and his worthiness to be respected, emulated, and worshiped, and his determination to return again to consummate his kingdom on earth. Let's begin by looking at Christ's royal sovereignty. When we say that Christ is sovereign, we mean that he has the strength and power to accomplish his will and that he has the legal authority and right to do so. In the ancient world, kings and emperors commanded the military forces of their countries, giving them the power to accomplish what they desired. The laws of their countries also acknowledged their right to rule and to govern, meaning that they also had the authority to accomplish what they desired. According to Paul, when Jesus ascended into heaven, God the Father vested him with this kind of sovereignty over all creation. Jesus is so powerful and so authoritative that his sovereignty extends over all other kings and rulers, whether they're on earth or in the spiritual realm. Is it any wonder that the sovereignty of Christ was important to Paul while he was in prison? Jesus, the Christ, rules over all creation. He rules over all earthly governments and nations and over every angel and demon. Clearly, not everything in creation obeys him as it should. But the Father has given Jesus the right to command obedience and the power to bring about submission to his will as he wishes. Christ has the absolute right and power to bless those he loves and to destroy his enemies. This facet of the gospel was a source of strength for Paul as he suffered 
and he proclaimed it boldly in his prison epistles. Besides emphasizing the sovereignty of Christ as the King of creation, Paul drew attention to Christ's honor, his glory and value that demands respect, emulation, and worship from all of his followers. While in prison, Paul repeatedly emphasized that Christ deserves honor because he is perfect and holy and righteous. He deserves honor because he holds a position of highest authority and because he executes that authority justly and righteously. He also deserves honor because he is the creator and sustainer of the universe. We could easily list hundreds of reasons for why Jesus is worthy of honor. But perhaps the greatest reason that Paul gave in his prison epistles for why Jesus deserves honor and praise is because he is divine. Jesus is God, and God is worthy of the highest honor imaginable. Paul's heightened awareness of Christ's honor also rose to the surface in these letters because some false teachers in the church did not appreciate how special Jesus was. Apparently, these false teachers had introduced the veneration of angels and spirits in addition to Jesus. Paul refuted these false teachings by emphasizing Christ's unique and surpassing greatness as the divine Son of God. Listen to the way he contrasted Christ with other spiritual beings in Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. In addition to speaking of Christ as King of creation in terms of his sovereignty and honor, Paul also emphasized Christ's determination to return to earth in order to consummate his kingdom. To understand Paul's outlook on the return of Christ, we must remember that his teaching about the end times, or his eschatology, grew out of traditional Jewish views of the end times. In the traditional Jewish theology of Paul's day, it was thought that Scripture presented two grand ages of humanity. Before Christ came, the world was in this age, the present age that was characterized by sin, death, and corruption. Then this present age was to be followed by the age to come, which the Bible also refers to as the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. According to widely held Jewish beliefs, the age to come would come all at once when the Messiah or Christ came. But according to Paul and the other New Testament authors, Jesus revealed that this traditional Jewish conception was not entirely accurate. The age to come would replace the present age, but not all at once. Instead, the two ages would overlap for a period of time, beginning from the earthly ministry of Christ which we'll refer to as the inauguration of the kingdom of God, and extending until Christ's return or second coming, which we'll refer to as the consummation of the kingdom of God. In between the inauguration and consummation is the period we'll call the continuation of the kingdom of God. This middle period is the time in which the church existed in Paul's day and in which it continues to exist today. Paul frequently appealed to his outlook on eschatology, or the last days, because it explained both the problems that he faced as a prisoner, and it addressed many of the problems of the churches to which he wrote while in prison. The present age of sin, death, and corruption had not been completely abolished. This is why the believers continued to suffer. Nevertheless, one day in the future, Jesus would return to bring final judgment against unbelievers and final blessings to all believers. In the meantime, Christians must hold fast to the hope that Jesus really will return. Right now, Jesus reigns as king from heaven, but he is not satisfied with that. He wants and plans to rule over every inch of creation as fully and gloriously as he now reigns in heaven. 
he will not be satisfied until he has finally and completely destroyed and punished all his enemies and blessed all his faithful believers in the new creation. And he plans to do this by spreading his kingdom across the entire earth. Paul knew Christ's plan was to rule over all creation, and he confidently asserted that Christ was determined to consummate his kingdom. It was for this reason that he wrote of believers having a future inheritance and of the great rewards that would be theirs when Christ returned. For example, consider his words in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. When you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Paul insisted that every Christian's future inheritance is guaranteed. God has promised and will not change his mind. As a result, Jesus must return in order to deliver our inheritance in the consummated kingdom. And in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, Paul wrote of Christ's return in these terms. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body. When Christ returns to consummate His kingdom on earth, our inheritance will include new glorified bodies. Paul held on to this hope for himself during his suffering. He also proclaimed it to Christ's followers with great confidence because he knew that Jesus had promised to return and that Jesus was determined to fulfill that promise. Now that we've looked at the doctrine that Jesus Christ is the King of creation, we should turn to a second teaching that points to the theological unity of the prison epistles namely, believers' union with Christ in His kingship. It is our union with Jesus that results in His sharing His blessings with us. Union with Christ is a central New Testament truth, especially affirmed in the Gospel according to John and in the letters of Paul. So in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the life. And In John chapter 3, verse 16, we read, Whoever believes in Him shall have eternal life. And there in John 3, 16, Jesus is not just the object of faith. He's the very place of faith. We believe into Him. We're incorporated into, into Him as branches into a vine. So if He's the life, if I'm to have life, I have got to be united to Him. According to Paul, when we believe in Jesus, We are united to Him in a mysterious, spiritual way in the eyes of God. And because we are united to Jesus, we are counted as blameless in the court of heaven, just as He is. And more than this, because we are united with Christ, we also share in the glory of His resurrection. Paul returned to this concept frequently in his prison epistles as he encouraged his readers that they shared in Christ's kingship. Often, he pointed out that because believers share in the honor of Christ's kingship, they receive blessings during the present continuation of Christ's kingdom and look forward to even greater blessings at the consummation of the kingdom. But Paul also appealed to our union with Christ in his kingship to give a proper perspective on things like suffering. He spoke of union with Christ in order to make it clear that Christ's followers do not suffer alone or in vain. This was true not only for Paul himself, but also for his readers. Paul took comfort in the fact that when we suffer for the gospel, our union with Christ ensures that Christ suffers and sympathizes with us. Paul also took comfort in knowing that through our union with Christ the King, our suffering benefits the church. And more than this, He taught that our suffering now completes the appointed suffering of Christ, setting the stage for our King's triumphant return. Now that we've looked at Christ as the King of creation, as well as believers' union with Christ in His kingship, we'll look at the requirement of ethical living that is rooted in Christ's kingship and our union with Him. Everyone familiar with Paul's writings knows that the Apostle spent as much time teaching about Christian ethics as he did addressing doctrinal matters. In fact, 
Nearly every time he introduced a doctrinal subject, he went on to explain how believers should apply that doctrine in practical ways to their lives. He not only taught correct thinking or doctrines, he also stressed proper behavior and emotions. Paul even went so far as to say that unless true teaching is applied to our lives in ways that change our behaviors and emotions, it is worthless. Listen to Paul's words to this effect in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. As Paul taught, even if we were to fathom all mysteries and to have all knowledge or perfect understanding of God, it is not enough. Having good doctrine, even perfect doctrine, amounts to nothing if that doctrine does not change our lives. If it is not joined with love and does not result in the ethical living in obedience to Christ, it is of no value. It should come as no surprise to us that Paul's prison epistles regularly emphasize ethical living. Our union with Christ obligates us and enables us to live ethically. And despite the struggles we all face, we are able to live according to the standard that Christ the King has set before us. We see then that Paul's prison epistles are theologically unified by Paul's rich and multifaceted doctrine of the kingship of Christ over all creation, including believers' union with Christ and our consequent responsibility and ability to live ethically. As we'll see in future lessons, Paul's prison epistles share many other themes in common. But the teaching that ties most of these common themes together is the fact that Jesus Christ is the King of creation. In future lessons, we'll look more closely at each of Paul's prison epistles. And as we do so, we should keep in mind the background that we've studied in this lesson. Knowing the hardships that Paul endured and the ministry he maintained in prison will help us understand Paul's motives and goals in writing to the churches of Colossa, Ephesus, and Philippi. And understanding the theological themes that unite these letters will help us understand many of Paul's particular instructions to each of these churches. Paul's experiences of suffering as a prisoner for Christ led him not only to offer much instruction to the churches to whom he wrote in the first century. When we read these portions of the New Testament in the light of Paul's circumstances, his efforts to minister to others, and the major themes that stirred his heart, we'll also see that they apply to our own lives and churches in the modern world.